What's up, Internet? Jordan here from Arrow to the Mead, and today we're doing another no water mead, this time with blueberries and carrot blossom honey. I call it Parlay Blue. This mead was also submitted to Mead Stampede 2022, where it scored 40 points with both of the judges, even better than the no water boche I did in the last video. So I'm obviously super excited about that score in its own right, and since I kept it in a carboy, I have the opportunity to implement the judge's feedback and make it even better. Without further ado, let's get in it. So like I mentioned, this blueberry bomb uses carrot blossom honey. And unlike a lot of other no waters I've done, instead of using Lalvin 71B for the yeast, it uses Seyfail US05. Really big fruit bombs, mostly use 71B because it's good for that style as I understand it. It performs really well under the high osmotic pressure created by the high starting gravities. USO5, on the other hand, as an ale yeast, has a significantly lower ABV tolerance, somewhere in the 9 to 11% range, in contrast with 71B's 14%. This means that the starting gravity can be significantly lower and still finish sweet allowing us to use something that isn't necessarily specifically chosen just to perform well under really high starting gravities. With that note about the yeast selection covered, let's get into the details of the rest of the recipe. For primary, I used 24 pounds of carrot blossom honey, which is a two gallon pail, 42 pounds of blueberries, and 23 grams of Seyfel USO5. 25 grams is technically the recommended pitch rate if you put this into batch builder, but this is sold in 11.5 gram packets, two of which is 23 grams, only two grams short of the suggested pitch rate. Since I had to order this yeast specifically for this brew, buying a whole extra packet seemed like overkill, and I just rounded to the nearest amount. As I have previously established in my yeast overload video, over pitching won't hurt your mead. Doing three packets would have been totally fine. It was just a matter of not wanting to spend the money on the extra packet. Pre-pitch, you will also need 0.6 grams of Lalzyme EXV. Based on the package instructions on this stuff, you technically need 0.525 grams, but again, it's sold in packets of 0.6 grams. And in this case, I rounded up slightly because it didn't seem worth it to try and save 0.025 grams. That's hardly even within the margin for error on my scale. Moving on to nutrients. As I've said before, on most brews, I will tell you guys to use whatever nutrition you are comfortable with. But on no water meads specifically, I do follow the nutritional guidelines set forth by community experts Storm Before Dawn and Corey. And as is becoming tradition for my no water mead videos, I will put a link to Storm's video breakdown on nutrition in fruit bombs down in the description. If you want full details on how nutrition in fruit bomb works and why we use what we use for these, I recommend checking out his video. Otherwise, I will just let you know what I use on this batch. Go firm by package instructions with some extra emphasis on please rehydrate your yeast on this one since we're technically under pitching just a hair. 13.25 grams of Fermade K and 12.62 grams of Dimonium Phosphate. Now for the process. I actually used Costco blueberries for this from the freezer aisle, which is fantastic because this mead turned out so well with fruit that is going to be so readily available to so many of you. And I love being able to share a recipe that is this accessible. Fruit available in your local freezer aisle will probably be sold in something between two to four pound bags. These blueberries came in three pound bags. So if I wanted to make the batch bigger or smaller, or even just tweak the ratio of honey to blueberries to adjust the sweetness level, those kinds of changes are easy to make without creating a lot of waste. I can also reliably control my brew schedule since I can pretty much roll over to Costco whenever I'm ready to brew. In contrast, when I sourced the fruit for my no water marionberry mead, I had to order it from a restaurant supplier online and the berries were only available in bulk 30 pound increments. Then shipping the fruit to your house complicates the matter even further. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to leave them out on the front porch in the California sun, nor do I have room for 60 pounds of berries in my freezer. So I needed to be home and ready to brew whenever they arrived. And that arrival date changed depending on how shipping went. It was unpredictable. That can lead to a lot of logistical challenges, especially if you don't have anyone in your household who's just kind of home all day. I don't know how big of an issue those kinds of challenges would be for any of you guys. 
but I think the freezer aisle is a lot closer to ubiquitous. So I take the time to emphasize the accessibility of some of these brews in the hopes that you can feel empowered to give them a try yourself. That all said, one of the drawbacks to having 42 pounds of blueberries three pounds at a time, is that you have 14 bags you have to individually open and pour into your fermenter. And as is pretty standard with the fruit that I get for these meads, it was frozen, so after we get it in the bucket, we have to wait a while for it to defrost. I actually got a little impatient on this one and tried adding the honey too soon, which made it pretty difficult to mix everything in together because cold honey, as you probably are aware, doesn't flow very well. That all said, I think it was worth it because check out this b-roll. The carrot blossom honey that I used on this mead is a rich and earthy flavor that Corey specifically recommended to go with blueberries. I know I've mentioned that name before already and have definitely mentioned it in previous videos, but if this happens to be the first time you're hearing it, Corey is a community member who is probably the most knowledgeable person on no water meads I've ever come across, and a lot of what I know about these I learned by picking his brain on the Discord server. Anyway, you can probably tell that I had zero headspace in this bucket, but that's okay because I did pour early and remember Remember, as berries start to defrost, they compress a little bit more and your headspace will open up a lot more. This bucket is probably big enough for 9 or 10 gallons, but as you can see, as these started to defrost, we eventually compressed down to about 7 gallons worth of initial volume. As this all starts to melt down to the point at which it's reasonably fluid, you'll want to introduce your Lalzyme EXV. This helps with maceration and extraction. Other than that, make sure you keep the bucket covered while the mixture continues to defrost. And check in every so often to see what the temperature is. While the must is really cold, it'll still be somewhere between frozen and refrigerated, and it won't be fermenting spontaneously on you. But once it starts to hit that temperature where it's no longer refrigerated, you do have to start to worry about it spoiling on you. Some folks wait until it hits room temperature. Personally, I err on the side of caution and I pitch a little bit early. Yeast can be sluggish when it's a little bit colder, but they generally won't die or anything like that. It'll just mean that your fermentation kicks off slower and I'd rather my yeast already be in there out competing any wild yeast that might be on the honey or the fruit rather than that I let the wild yeast get a head start because I wait too long to get my yeast in there. Anyway, once you hit that pitchable temperature, rehydrate your yeast with GoFirm and throw it in the bucket. And remember, as always, during the first week, make sure you punch that fruit cap two to three times a day. This ensures that the cap doesn't dry out and start to mold on you, and gives you a chance to aerate the yeast a little bit, make sure that they have enough oxygen and to get some of the carbon dioxide out of solution during the most active times of fermentation, and especially this early on when oxygen is actually still fairly useful as the yeast will utilize it. Add the first half of your nutrients at 24 hours and the second half at 48 hours. You may have noticed we're only using Fermaid K and Diamonium Phosphate on this one. Remember, on a no water mead like this with six whole pounds of fruit per gallon, there is actually a noticeable amount of natural nitrogen introduced by the fruit. So when we add our nutrition to this type of mead specifically, we mostly add the inorganic kinds which are available in Fermade K and DAP. After the first week comes the part that racks my nerves every single time, but you leave it sealed for three more weeks. Opening the lid at this point risks exposing the mead to more oxygen and mold spores, which could probably obviously be problematic but you wanna try and hit about four weeks total exposure to the fruit skins for the development and extraction of tannins. It's a little nerve wracking not being able to check and make sure it's okay for those three weeks, but do your best because checking only introduces more exposure. So far, my experience has been that the amount of CO2 that is off-gassing out of solution ends up creating something of a blanket and keeping the lid on helps keep enough moisture in there that the fruit cap doesn't actually dry out and no mold forms. Fingers crossed that that continues to work for me and that if any of you try a recipe like this, it works for you as well. If you happen to be unlucky and you get mold though, you know what to do. When it's time to rack, remember that racking fruit bombs can be a difficult process. As with a no water boche, I tried placing my hop spider inside of the mead and the racking cane inside of that. This functions as sort of a loose filter to help keep the berries out while allowing you to get the mead. And I actually got three and a half gallons of free run product this way, which is not too bad. Then I moved on to pressing, which again, I do an inconvenient but very budget friendly way. I pour the berries into brew bags and then squeeze the heck out of them. As I mentioned in the last video, this is absolutely brutal on your forearms, but it does seem to be effective and it is pretty budget friendly equipment. 
I got an additional two gallons this way, which is the difference between a three gallon carboy with some leftovers and random bottles and a five gallon carboy and some leftovers and some random bottles. Especially considering how much sediment will probably settle out of this over time, given how much fruit was in here, this is a big and important difference in my opinion. As an additional note on the squeezing, racking, and pressing process, I added 20 ppm of potassium metabisulfite to function as an oxygen scavenger just to help guard against the risk of oxidation that I cause when I, well, treat the mead this way. Something to keep in mind is that the press product you get when you press this way is a lot more tannin heavy than the free run product. So I do recommend keeping them separate for the first initial few months of secondary and then taste testing later after they've melded a little bit to see how good they're coming out on their own or blended together. I ended up blending all of mine together. And that may be partly because it does need more tannins. When I initially reached out to Corey to pick his brain for suggestions on how to do blueberries as a no water mead, he recommended I put oak in secondary. But I found that because I blended my pressed and free run product together, I introduced so much tannin from non-oak sources that there wasn't really space left, so to speak, in the balancing for me to add oak on top of that. I made an audible call, essentially in the middle of this recipe, that I was okay with that and moved forward without oak. But if you really like the idea of having an oaked blueberry, no water mead, you really want to be careful about whether or not you introduce all of the pressed product back into your main body of free run product. And if for any reason you decide not to add all of your pressed product back in with your free run, don't toss out the stuff that you don't blend. You may find that it's useful for introducing some extra tannins and balancing a completely different mead. Now this is a mead that after I got to this point in the process, I was able to send off to a lab and get the lab results. So let's take a look at those real quick. The ABV was 11.56%. The original gravity was 1.16131. The final gravity was 1.0798. And the pH was 3.70. I don't normally have the technology to read the pH, so I'm not actually sure how that compares to my other meads, but I thought I would include it. The ABV is right on the nose there, with 11% being the upper limit of the 9-11% to range that USO5 has on paper. Breaking just a little bit past that 11% wall does suggest that my fermentation was fairly healthy. But I was a little surprised to see my gravity this high here. My original gravity was actually a whole 11 points off of the calculated original gravity that I thought I was going to have when I set up this recipe. And I think that's because I estimated the volume of my blueberries at 8.25 pounds per gallon. When I went back and ran the numbers again after receiving these lab results, I realized that if I had calculated my blueberries at 9 pounds per gallon volume instead, that would have brought my original gravity up several points to 1.157, and I would have only been off by 4 points instead of 11. And that final gravity is high. At nearly 1080, we've finished sweeter than some brews start. This is very likely too sweet for at least some of you, but it's pretty near perfect to my palate. I would actually rank this personally higher than the Marionberry Mead I submitted to last year's Mead Stampede. The Marionberry Mead took second place and scored a whole point and a half higher with the judges than this one did, but honestly, I think this one might be better. It's that good. And I think a huge part of that is the carrot blossom honey. This is the first mead where I really tried to use a carefully selected varietal and from a quality source that wasn't just the cheapest place to get that honey. As my channel progresses, I really do hope to get the chance to use some more interesting and fun and specific varietals. This ended up sitting in secondary for about a year actually before I got around to doing more bench trials to try and figure out how to finish this. With my partner's help and a lot of bench trials, we ultimately settled on introducing freshly ground pepper and parsley from the garden. We ended up using two teaspoons of the pepper in a little tea bag and 200 parsley leaves. It's also flat leaf parsley, by the way. We bench trialed using other types of parsley and they, they do not behave the same way. The pepper was in there for about two days before we pulled it out and the parsley was in there for eight. And pepper, just like with the no water boche, is something that this mead could totally have handled much more of. But again, I didn't really want this to be a pepper mead. 
I keep feeling like there's gotta be a way to make a mead where pepper is the star that's not as expensive as the no water mead. I wanted to make sure that the blueberry still shined and the pepper didn't overpower it. In the end, I was a little unsure where to categorize this when I submitted it to Mead Stampede 2022. Let's take a look at the score sheets and you might see what I mean. If we pull these up here, we can see, oh, Mandy, hello. On the bouquet and aroma, both gave medium for the honey and low on the alcohol, which I think is good and accurate. Fermentation and off aromas were both pretty low, not completely gone, but pretty low, and complexity was in the middle. Both mentioned the honey in the aroma. Seems like that went pretty well overall. Mandy, in fact, gave it a 10 out of 10. That's awesome. The appearance was somewhere between ruby and indigo, although both judges gave it a little bit of room for improvement on the clarity. And again, just like with the No Water Boche, I do see that as very likely having to do with the fact that I was making modifications via spices in secondary shortly before I ended up bottling this and sending it off to the competition. Legs were about the middle on both and still on the carbonation. On flavor, honey ranks kind of medium to high. Sweetness, again, not actually topping the charts off here. Acidity, medium-ish. Tannins, a little low. Alcohol, very low. Carbonation, none. Body, this was probably the biggest difference between the two judges here, medium versus almost completely full on body. Aftertaste is pretty medium on both and off flavors, almost none. We can see here from the scoring that though it performed very well, both judges felt that it wasn't quite balanced. The sweetness was a little too high compared to the acid tannin levels. In the comments here, we can also see that the parsley and pepper were faint. And I think this might be part of the reason that I lost out just a little bit of points compared to the Marionberry mead, which didn't have any spices. The Marionberry mead was entered as a fruit mead only, whereas Parlay Blue here was entered as a fruit and spice mead. But I intentionally kept the spices on this one very faint. I wanted them to help balance the mead more so than I wanted you to taste them. And the judges noticed that. This was entered as a fruit and spice mead with barely perceptible spices. As far as matching the definition of the category goes, that's maybe not the best way to have done this. I wonder if it would have scored slightly, like slightly better, if I had entered it as a straight fruit mead. But I was worried that because you could technically ever so taste the spices that it didn't count and it'd be kind of cheating to put it up against other fruit meads with the help of spices. I don't know. Either way, I want to emphasize real quick that what I'm discussing here in terms of the category entry possibly impacting the score a tiny bit is only for the sake of the difference between how this one scored at 40 points from both judges versus the Marionberry Mead I entered last year that scored 40 and 43 for an average of 41.5 and barely beat this mead out. Even though I think that Parley Blue is actually a better overall mead than the Marionberry one was. Anyway, I will be looking at balancing this mead with just a little bit more parsley and possibly pepper to take it the rest of the way there before I bottle it. All said though, my personal opinion, this is the best mead I have brewed so far. So I'm very excited that it performed very well at Mead Stampede. Other than that, guys, that's, that's what I got for you today. So thanks for joining me and have a good however long until I see you again.